O God, you're never going to make comments. Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to Jesus Christ. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? but they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of God, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Amen. You may be seated. Can I just bring these back to you? Yeah. I get by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> well, it certainly has been a great couple of months to be an Episcopalian. Woo! Actually, it's been quite a ride. Whoever imagined that interest in this, our beloved Episcopal Church, especially in a time of declining interest in institutional religion would be happening in the spring of 2018. 
I read that on Saturday, uh, May the 19th, which was the day of Meghan and Harry's wedding, the word Episcopalian was the number one searched word on Google. Number one. That's millions of hits. That is simply amazing. You can't buy that kind of advertising. In fact, based on the past few weeks, what's been happening in our church and what the church is doing in the life of the world, I'm sensing that we may be at the beginning of another great awakening, similar to the great awakenings in the 1800s, but this one now here at the beginning of the 21st century. We can mark the beginning of this great awakening with the elegant and dignified funeral of former First Lady Barbara Bush on April 21st. Her funeral was held at St. Martin's Episcopal Church in Houston, which, for those of you who don't know, is the largest parish in our denomination with over 7,000 members. As a comparison, we hover around 350. So Anthony and I, who are eternally curious about all things ecclesial, went to St. Martin's website and found out they have 14 clergy on staff. And we stopped counting at 120 members of the staff at that enormous church complex. They even have a cafe. As a comparison, we have, well, one paid clergy person and are graced by several non-paid clergy persons. And we have four staff. St. Martin's is one huge parish. In addition to the beautiful liturgy, what so moved so many viewers of Mrs. Bush's televised funeral was the sight of many of our governmental leaders of the past 30 plus years, both Republican and Democrat, who gathered for this funeral. And I think more importantly, to see them treat one another with respect and with dignity and even with some real affection. Political differences were placed aside and what bound all of the people gathered there and I think what bound us who were watching this televised funeral was a love of our nation and a desire to honor this woman who had served our country so well. We are not accustomed to that kind of dignity and respect from the political class of late much less the understanding that the bonds of being an American trumps being partisan. This tableau of political comedy offered us hope, I believe, in the midst of the muck and the mire that we experience so often these days. And it was a, a poignant reminder of the great values of faith and of nation that go beyond partisan politics and personal gain. It certainly was a plumb line of how Barbara Bush led her life. And I know that as she gazed down at the gathered congregation from her place in the eternity of heaven that she was very pleased. And it all happened in an Episcopal church. What better setting for an opportunity to display what justice and dignity for all people and respecting the dignity of every human being looks like. And then, of course, there was the royal wedding on May 19th. The wedding, to be sure, was lovely, and it was everything we had hoped for with the pomp and circumstance and the, the majesty of a royal wedding as only the Brits can do it. And I think for many of us, it's fulfilled this secret desire we all have for a taste of royal life ourselves or our own desires to be a prince or a princess, at least for a little while in our lives. But it was the sermon. It was the sermon by our own presiding bishop, the most reverend Michael B. Curry, that rocked the boat at that wedding. I love the looks on the dour royals sitting there. That was worth the price of admission alone. And Bishop Curry preached about God's love, about God's love, and he stated we must discover love, the redemptive power of love, and when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world. 
delivered in Curry's powerful African-American Baptist oratorical style. His sermon was a, a shot heard round the world. The estimated viewership was two billion people. Two billion people for that wedding. And those who might have believed that religion was moribund, if not dead, were given a new insight into this revival that is bubbling up, that is growing, that is infecting people from this Episcopal Church under Bishop Curry's leadership, what he calls the Jesus Movement. Even professed atheists were having doubts about denying God as God was so clearly palpable in this charismatic and holy man. Curry is our LeBron James. <laughs> and I will let the delicious irony of that word play stand on its own in the midst of the NBA finals between the Cavs and the Warriors. Curry is our LeBron James. In the midst of the depressing din and chaos we currently live in, when the news always seems to leave a dark pall hanging over our heads, these two services offered a brief Sabbath rest to weary and demoralized people the world over. And now when I say Sabbath rest, I mean more than just a break from the demands of life and the ways of the world. It's about more than sleeping in late or about getting some R and R. Rather, what I mean by Sabbath is a period of time which is life-oriented and life-giving. The proper function of the Sabbath is to promote life and to give hope, extolling God as a liberator for all the evil ways that would desire to enslave us, which means ultimately that Sabbath is about God's love. Life-giving Sabbath restores hope in the midst of hopelessness. And what could be more loving than that? We poignantly witnessed and experienced this in Bishop Curry's sermon about love, which was so life-giving that it compelled millions of people to inquire, who is this Episcopal guy and what is this church all about? Sabbath as life-giving is the point of what happens in the gospel story we heard from Mark today, where we have two incidences that occur on the Sabbath. In the first, the religious authorities condemn Jesus for allowing his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath to assuage their hunger. The authorities saw this as a violation of the prohibition to work on the Sabbath. Regretfully, Sabbath, as interpreted by the institutional religion, had become a life-denying thing, a dark pall that over, hung over people's heads like a claustrophobic shroud. It had become morally atrophied. Jesus, clearly a much better scholar of Scripture than the authorities, points out that even the iconic David and his companions ate the bread of the presence when they were famished, even though this holy bread was reserved only for the priests. And by alleviating David's hunger, the holy bread became life-giving and sustained the life of Israel's future great king. The Sabbath was a time which became literally life-giving, allowing David and his followers to have hope for their future. And in the second story, it is again Sabbath. Jesus encounters a man with a withered hand. In other words, a, a man who was crippled with a physical deformity. And despite the prohibition again to work on the Sabbath, Jesus heals him. Please note, he does not mock him. He heals him. And again, the religious authorities are aghast that he has performed an act of work on the Sabbath. And Jesus reminds them that the Sabbath was made for humanity, and humanity not made for the Sabbath. Jesus contends that sometimes certain demands of the law are rightly set aside in favor of pursuing greater values, of meeting greater needs, especially when those greater needs promote a person's well-being and give them their life back. 
These are all life-giving moments in the gospel, and in both instances, they lead to hope when things seem hopeless. What Jesus ultimately is conveying in this story is that the Sabbath, as given by God, is meant for life and for hope and for love. Jesus, Bishop Curry, and the Episcopal Church these past few weeks remind us that God's life-giving Sabbath love will keep us from actually atrophying into a moral vacuum when that seems like an all too real possibility. A commentary I read stated, quote, that if you keep the Sabbath, you don't get to overlook those whose lives are being threatened on a daily basis. If you keep the Sabbath, you don't get to pass over how the lives of others are being stripped of their worth and dignity. If you keep the Sabbath, you don't have qualifiers or quantifiers about who deserves abundant life. That's what it means to be a part of the Jesus movement. Proclaiming the love of God, loving God, loving our neighbor, and loving one another as Jesus has loved us. They are the message of the new great awakening which has begun, the genesis of which is in our beloved church. It is life-giving and it will redeal us from the moral atrophy that threatens us. As Bishop Curry proclaimed in his wedding sermon, love is the way. What a great time to be an Episcopalian. Amen. Joining together on page nine, let us connect with our historic faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, earth of, of all that is seen and, and unseen. We, we acknowledge in one Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son, Son of God, God eternally begotten of the Father, Father God, God from God, God light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended, he ascended into, into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In confidence, we offer our prayers to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, the Lord, have mercy. That the church may shine with the glory of the face of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the harvest of summer be justly distributed among the hungry, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the laws and customs of our society be observed with charity and goodwill, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That those graduating from school, especially Skyler Bigman, Vera Ruffin, and Laura Stewart, may continue to grow in knowledge and wisdom, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That all of us gathered here may have recreation and refreshment this Sunday and every Sunday. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That each Sabbath bring us closer to the health and wholesomeness of God's reign. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That all the sick may be healed, especially James, Wynn, Pat, Jack, Pat, Charlie, Sandra, Louise, Nancy. Matt, Adelia, John, Peggy, 
Jill, Stephanie, Peggy, Danny, Goody, Catherine, Sandy, Sarah and Fred, Jackie, Daniela and the baby Aurora, Jane, Mary Jo, Tom and Jim, Birdie, Ann, Martha, Lisa, Peter, and Lenore. We pray also for those places torn by war, strife, and natural disaster, especially Puerto Rico and the Hawaiian United States, and Afghanistan, the Caribbean Islands, Haiti, Iraq, Israel, Mexico, Myanmar, Palestine, South Sudan, Syria, Venezuela, and Denmark. I invite your, inter your additional intercessions at this time. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord of our that the gifts of love and friendship in our common life continue to enrich us all, especially as we rejoice with those having birthdays this week, Abigail and Barney, Gina Lucoma, Sean and Rubidus Lucas, and Alice Fletcher, and those celebrating anniversaries, especially Katie and Matthew Medic, and Matthew Bode and Leland the Thigny. And for those for whom the altar flowers are offered, the Wilson Lockwood and Judy Julie Schneider Baker. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord In the communion of the Holy Spirit, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and with all the saints of the light, let us commend our lives and the lives of one another to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Loving God, you call us to a way of healing and of joy. Allow us to share that joy and that love and that compassion with all whom we meet. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Together, let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess, we confess that, that we have sinned against you, opposing, opposing your will in our lives. We, we have, have denied, denied your goodness, goodness in each other, in, other, in ourselves, and, and in the world you have created. We, we repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. At this time, I invite the congregation to be seated and I invite uh, Leslie and Jay to come forward for our choir and Christian education recognitions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's really been a wonderful year being able to serve as your music director and organist. And it's really been, it's been a very special thing to me to be able to be a part of such a wonderful and friendly, really filled with the love of Christ with the family here in Shaker Heights. And I moved from Ann Arbor and it's a long way from home, but I'm glad that I have been able to here. I want to say thank you to Peter, our wonderful rector, and we're very glad that he's back.
adults week after week, uh, building relationships with our children, um, preparing lessons, and sharing their faith with the children of this church. Um, teaching is a, a real privilege, and it's a lot of work. And uh, as a parish, we are all so grateful to our teachers. So please let me just thank our teachers and leaders by name. First, I'd like to just thank our substitute teachers this year. If I call your name, wave your hands, everybody knows who you are. Uh, we have Ann Elliott, Christina Forward, Melissa Winberry, Jack Shelley, and Rita Simpson Black. Thank you all very much. Uh, next, I'd also like to thank our child caregivers who work every week and our teachers who serve every Sunday. So please stand when I call your name and stay standing and we'll give our applause at the end. In the nursery, we have Camille Bowers and Julie Esmond, Deb Schelling and Sarah Gage are in the Good Shepherd Atrium. Tracy Hawkins and Catherine Nitschke are in the True Vine Atrium. Lynn Winkleman and Dennis Harrison are in the Golden Thread Atrium. Dana Biggerman and Matt Hooley have worked with our Red 13 youth. And Mark Swain Fox and Amy McKenney have worked with our youth group. Betty Condrick and the Reverend Peter Foss have worked with our adult education. Here in Schuyler, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord be with you this and every day of your life and give you peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And if uh, Leslie and Jay could come forward momentarily. 
We have a little token of our appreciation for your leadership for both the music program and the formation program. And we hope that these beautify your home for this wonderful summer season that we are in. So blessings to both of you. Thank you. Christ be with all of you. Please be seated. It's great to see you on this beautiful summer morning. A few announcements today. Uh, at four o'clock, we will have our next in the concerts at the Crossroads series. If you're looking for something cultural to do and hear some beautiful music, Chase Castle will be at the organ for a program today at four o'clock. Please do join us. Our outdoor cleanup day is this coming Saturday, which is June the 9th. Uh, this is a uh, uh, revolved around uh, Troop 662, which is our Boy Scout troop, but many hands will help get the property uh, in shape for the summer season. So if you can join us for uh, a while, sometime between 9 and 12 o'clock on Saturday, that would be great. The property committee will be here and there will be refreshments to sustain the laborers in the field. Next week, Sunday, is our annual parish picnic, which will be held here on our property. Um, and we will be providing hamburgers and hot dogs and buns and condiments and soft drinks. And we ask that you provide the sides and the desserts. There's a sign-up sheet for uh, that purpose to indicate what you might be bringing. Uh, and if you could help Anne and Michelle, are they here? Anna and Michelle. Oh, there it is. Back there, Usher. Um, they would appreciate it. They're coordinating the picnic this year. And we have a very special surprise guest coming for the picnic uh, for the children and for the young at heart. So do plan on joining us and pray for a, a day like today. Uh, worship hours will change for the summer two weeks from today. Um, they will go 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. The service will be a half hour earlier for the summer months. We were going to start that next week, but realized it might be too early uh, to uh, actually have a picnic if we were done by 11 o'clock. So one more week at 1030 and then the summer season through Labor Day weekend, 10 o'clock for this service. Coffee Hour hospitality hosts are being looked for. Uh, Coffee Hour is a wonderful part of our communal life together, but it takes people to bring the goodies that we enjoy. So if you can help with that, there is a sign-up sheet for that on the table in the Great Hall. And several people have asked about the stoles Megan and I are wearing. My stole, of course, is, uh, is uh, the rainbow colors in the uh, cross uh, form. And Megan's stole is an orange stole, which is the anti-gun violence stole in the Episcopal Church. So um, we're honoring both uh, uh, our fight against uh, reducing gun violence in our society and honoring the inclusion of all people in all of our culture today through our stoles. And finally, I do want to thank you for uh, all of your prayers and your support and the cards and the flowers and the food and all of those things that you have offered uh, me and Anthony during these past few weeks as I've been convalescing from my surgery. They have been most appreciated uh, and it's been especially wonderful not to have to worry about the evening meal. Uh, it's one less stressor in our lives. And um, I'm going to be writing Pope Francis this week to have Anthony canonized as a, a new saint uh, after dealing with me as a rather cranky patient. Thank you for all of that. Thank you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
We continue together on page 12. Everyone, without exception, is welcome to this God's table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread the gifts of God for the people of God.
Communion prayer is found at the bottom of page 20. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have too much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may God's blessing be with you, Christ's peace be with you, and the Spirit's outpouring be with you today and always. Amen.